was esteemed colleagues uh, we've taken some rest after a heated debate on the anti-monopoly service uh, while there are seats uh, you can make yourself comfortable to listen to the speakers and before announcing the next speaker I would like to say that uh, since the law the agreement on Eurasian Economic Union is in force uh, since the 1st of January this year and the economic boundaries existing now are no longer defined by the administrative boundaries by our countries but go far beyond so it's not only Russian Federation it's now Russian Federation Belarus Kazakhstan Armenia and I would like to pass the floor to the head of the Department of Competitive Policy and State Procurement Policy of the Eurasian Economic Commission, Sergei Maximov. Sergei, the floor is yours. Esteemed Chair, esteemed colleagues, the Eurasian Economic Union is not only an economic but also a legal reality. Starting with the 1st of January, the idea expressed by President Nazarbayev over 20 years ago in Moscow State Universities has been implemented and the Eurasian Economic Union is already at work. This is an unusual uh, this is an unusual organization despite its seeming similarity to other international unions because it has several agencies whose authority and competences differ very much from a lot of similar agencies in other countries. It isn't by no chance that the media paid attention to the fact that there is a super um, national agency and one of such agencies is the Eurasian Economic Commission which is not an exclusively executive body of the Union, but it is an agency that performs functions similar to judicial without replacing the Eurasian Economic Court. And this slide shows here that uh, the European Commission has the status of a super national or agency. The structure of the European Com Eurasian Economic Commission is such that the investigation into the uh, anti-monopoly cases uh, is affected by two departments and apart from the department that I represent the Department of Competitive Policy and Policy in the area of state procurement there is a, an anti-monopoly regulation department which deals with uh, investigations of monopolies uh, in the territories of the Eurasian Economic Union. One week ago, it should be noted that after the submission of ratification papers by uh, Russian Federation and after Russia again uh, emphasized that it will follow the uh, law on information, the procedure of uh, anti-monopoly investigation has become possible. 
So far we don't have any cases. Uh, we keep consulting the anti-monopoly agency of Russian Federation and other countries concerning joint investigations and uh, we are speaking about joint investigations and of course the Commission has its own authority in this part and certainly these, this authority uh, will be used uh, in collaboration, in mandatory collaboration with all the anti-monopoly agencies. I would attract your attention to the fact that Apart from the Republic of Armenia, which has been a full-fledged member uh, of the Eurasian Economic Union since the 2nd of uh, uh, January, uh, the Union has been joined by the Kyrgyz Republic. The appropriate law has been passed in the Parliament of Kyrgyzstan, and we are expecting their ratification of protocols about joining the Eurasian Economic Union, and certainly their agencies will also be involved in anti-monopoly investigations. I would like to say a couple of words about uh, the court of the Eurasian Economic Union. It is uh, an agency. At first look, a very usual agency in reality the statute for that court, which has been approved in Appendix 2 to the Agreement on Eurasian Economic Union, and that statute defines that uh, court as a constitutional court and as the highest judicial instance. Alongside with uh, the higher council of Eurasian Union. This is the only body that can interpret the provisions of the agreement. Even the Commission itself doesn't have uh, that authority. And so the economic entities and the agencies of and the parties that want to get the interpretation of the agreement must address the court for such interpretation. A lot of provisions do need interpretation, including those in the sphere of anti-monopoly regulation, and without such interpretations and explanations it would be very difficult to come to practical matters. The position of our depart uh, department is that this court must have the authority on uh, providing explanations on law enforcement because the only because it's only uh, the, uh, the it is only uh, the act of uh, uh, law enforcement uh, that uh, provides the interpretation of, of the agreement when we're talking about the Eurasian economic union without interpreting the practices I would emphasize uh, that the, uh, it is the Supreme Court of the Russian Federation that provides such interpretation, not the Constitutional Court, I would emphasize. And without that, it's very difficult uh, to be engaged in law enforcement. And unless we do that, uh, it will take us a long time to develop such law enforcement practices. We will be waiting for the final uh, court judgments, and then we will be able to say that we have a precedent which will certainly impact the f subsequent law enforcement procedures. I would say a couple of uh, words about rather an unusual decision, which is very rarely used in international agreements and treaties. The agreement on the Eurasian Economic Union establishes administrative responsibility for violating the antitrust laws, and that's about uh, six provisions. There's about six provisions about that, and you will be able to look at slides eight and nine, which make reference to specific articles 
of Appendix 19 to the agreement, which establish penalty amounts which are comparable to those used in Russia. Sometimes they are higher, sometimes they are lower. And uh, there's also an overlapping concerning the entities to which those provisions are applied. Well, there's nothing new in the agreement about the uh, guilt. Well, it's one of the most interesting theoretical and practical issues, but it remains as it was. Yes. Please note that if we look at all other uh, violations of law, uh, there's no policy of uh, common responsibility. Basically, the legislator of each state uh, decides on this issue by itself. And uh, the issues of uh, criminal responsibility are decided by the member states on their own and are resolved by the member states on their own. And it will definitely influence quite significantly the um, anti-monopoly policy of the Union in general and the way this policy is being carried out in uh, particular subjects of the Union, meaning the states themselves that join this Union. Now let us look at slide number 17 to, uh, right now. 17, please. Now we're going to talk about some key and maybe future the problems of the Union's development, because we've already talked about uh, codification of the anti-monopoly legislation or, or antitrust legislation, the competition legislation. It's quite a topical issue for the Union. However, there's no high presidium yet established for this particular problem, but there is a tendency that um, this idea has to be brought in front of our legal community for them to decide which way to go, uh, how fast to go in order to get there. I mean, uh, the, the, this single code, this um, antitrust or competition code in the whole Eurasian Union or the Customs Union. And why we need to do this, I'll uh, tell about that later. So. One of the main um, possibilities is uh, developing common standards of competition. Again, it would uh, be governing the whole Eurasian Union. Unfortunately, apart from Russia, nobody else is talking about those standards and norms. I mean, those states of the uh, Eurasian Union. And the competition has to be developed not by the legal means, and definitely not only by the legal means. And it's not enough to develop competition by means of applying protection measures, because protection measures are necessary, but they're not sufficient to protect competition. And uh, I think the heads of anti-monopoly agencies and competition agencies of member states uh, talked about that several times over. We need some pro-competition norms, the ones that would promote, uh, enhance competition. And they have to be implemented uh, under a single legal framework. And there should be a competition code. And I think that this idea has potential and it has to be discussed. Moreover, the anti-monopoly body of Russian Federation, the Federal Anti-Monopoly uh, anti Service, has recently discussed and even initiated the um, research, a scientific paper where and all the experts in this research have agreed that this has to be dealt with and this question is truly truly topical the main beneficiary of the competition code will be the man uh, a person human beings because they need to understand uh, the reason the essence of any anti-monopoly norms and competition norms any law uh, gravitates towards codification and this is a very natural way of developing law codifying this law uh, I'm not talking about the competition code as a thing per se it might be just an overarching framework or something that is much more structured than what we have now but something really should be there yeah, and another question that we need to discuss is 
the policy, a single and common policy of fighting violations of the anti-monopoly law. Uh, I think we are in the same boat just for the six articles uh, um, that uh, foresee certain uh, punishment for the violation of the anti-monopoly law. Uh, basically, uh, it's the, these things are fixed in the uh, Eurasian Union uh, codes and they're similar to national codes. For other violations and for other wrongdoings, there is no single policy uh, of uh, pursuing this matter. Uh, and we're not thinking about how to really check our watches and how to agree upon something uh, singular. Moreover, the member states of the Union don't really understand how they want to do it, because nobody is taking part in a, uh, in a committee of uh, legislative proposals. Because there's a committee of legislative proposals in Russian Federation, and we don't have members of other member states in this committee. We might have uh, representatives of this overarching body of the Eurasian Union itself, but not from the member states, separate member states. So that brings questions. Uh, and there are quite significant differences, let me tell you. Uh, for example, uh, administrative... For example, no non-provision... Well, of something to the anti-monopoly body of the Eurasian Union, it's been fixed in uh, Article Number 19. But in different countries, there's different responsibility for non-presenting some documents to the anti-monopoly body. For example, in the Russian Federation, it's quite interesting. In Belarus, if you don't provide information to the anti-monopoly body, you're going to be prosecuted uh, by criminal justice like it was 20 years ago uh, in the Russian Federation. Uh, there's been criminal responsibility for not presenting the materials that the anti-monopoly body is asking for. For example, some other things. Let's take uh, criminal responsibility for cartels. In Kazakhstan, since 1st of January, the new criminal code has been enacted. Where? much more stringent measures are being uh, applied. Uh, much more stringent consequences will follow if you violate competition law in Kazakhstan as opposed to Russia. In Russia, uh, only cartels. And again, if the damage inflicted is high or high profits are being generated and in any case if we talk about cartels uh, the profits would be uh, really big so that's the only corpus delicto that would lead to criminal criminal prosecution in Kazakhstan any violation of any lines of the anti-monopoly law will bring you to criminal justice just inflicting damage to a person uh, for a total amount of more than 700,000 rubles is already enough ground for taking this person to criminal responsibility. So when at one point and when at one geography and location of the Eurasian Union you can bring a person to criminal court if you inflict him damage of more than 3 million rubles, but at the other time, um, at the other end of this Eurasian Union you can uh, prosecute a person in criminal court just for inflicting him damage for what 700,000 700, rubles, it creates lots of barriers for businesses, right? Uh, it, well, I'm referring to the citation of my colleague here, the, the big it's the small and it's similar to that the business finds the most weak jurisdictions right where it's where he bears less consequences for his actions or mistakes and when somebody asks when businesses are asked which country is more suitable for you to do business in definitely they will choose the country where the risks are lower for example even in one single common union with one single border um, that's not normal it's not it's not feasible we've been talking about the parallel import right about the medications and fuels um we've talked about that and i talked about that in my presentation so i cannot but mention the fact that we have principally different responsibilities and approaches to responsibilities in different member states of the union for bootlegging for smuggling this corpus delicti, right, of uh, violating um, uh, customs uh, code. In Kazakhstan, 
is just enough to bring any good with any violation of any custom rules through the through the Kazakh border and the Kazakh border is similar to the Union border and again if you calculate this amount to 3 million ruble and again I can make some mistakes because periodically they change the sum and they change the exchange rate and so on and so forth but again that's enough to to bring a person to justice in Russian Federation the situation is completely different if we talk about this part of the border of Russia that's under the Russian jurisdiction, right? Uh, other responsibilities are there with Belarus, uh, Armenia, Kyrgyzia. Again, everything is different. And without a single policy, uh, at least an agreed policy, at least the corridors of criminal responsibility, right? All the, the, the bases, criminal bases, administrative basis for violating competition rules and everything related to competition rules they must be well at least in the same lines uh, on the 23rd of february russia has uh, adopted a new law on uh, responsibility of uh, illegal turnover of medications uh, forged medications uh, low quality medications counterfeit medications and unregistered medications on the 23rd of february this law was enacted and put into force and at the same day a state committee was established to counteract again in the russian federation to counteract the illegal trafficking and turnover of any industrial products whatsoever and that's quite an interesting thing because the attention towards this issue is so vast because not in a single other member uh, of the eurasian union you can get a person to court for this uh, to criminal court that's why so the jurisdiction will be built considering this vector and our investigative committee showed us how they're going to act because the first case has already been has already been uh, brought up the first cases were almost dropped uh, from their start uh, because of the amnesty uh, because uh, the article 238 um, uh, subclause number one was used and that's why this uh, article of people convicted uh, using this article had to be uh, were subject to amnesty and uh, let me talk about this idea of protecting the idea of parallel import many critics of this idea say that together with the parallel imports uh, we will get lots and lots of counterfeit goods and smuggled goods because it will be much less easier to control the whole situation and it will be very difficult to uh, exert this control and oversight. Um, well, the Russian Federation is trying to protect the interests of all and the Eurasian Union trying to protect them from uh, counterfeit medications and we've undertaken quite significant efforts for example here in Russian Federation we have some very serious tools to, to, to counteract that and we even have a convention to be ratified if this convention is going to be ratified in the nearest future uh, in the nearest days it will automatically be put into force because Russia is the fifth party to the convention is the member of the Council of Europe and if this convention is ratified uh, automatically this convention is actively actively endorsed for the rest of the world and you can actively join there are 23 countries but unfortunately we don't have members of our union uh, the Eurasian Union and I think they need to think about it um, again the criminal responsibility uh, here brings lots and lots of questions uh, and these questions have been discussed among scholars and scientists and we did a number of roundtables around these topics uh, there is an opinion that probably it's a very good instrument but it has to be well criminal responsibility for double for parallel imports but you have to be really careful with this because you can't really Im imagine what will happen in the Russian Federation as soon as uh, the media or it will be leaked into the media that uh, a company X has been brought charges uh, judges against and a particular person well not not a particular person has been brought to court for that but a company in general if it's not Gazprom or Rosneft this company will start dying just the second day after this information got leaked into the media right as soon as the media publishes that it's been it's, it's been prosecuted so the, the the situation of the European or Eurasian Union is such that we must really think about balances checks and balances maybe we should establish some special way of uh, initiating uh, legal procedures against uh, legal entities 
And I know that the Supreme Court is not yet supporting this idea, but at least for now. It would, re it would really be great to discuss this issue on the level of the Eurasian Union in general. So in the end of my presentation, and the end of my speech, I would like to note your, uh, to draw your attention to the three ideas. Uh, can we have slide number 17, please, on the screen? Uh, these ideas are long-term perspectives, or long-term objectives that we have to face. Probably these are, these are not long-term. I think they are more of a mid-term or rather short-term basis. Uh, the Eurasian Committee supports the idea that I think has been, well, that's, that, that I think uh, initiated from Russia. And this is an idea of producing and publishing the white and the black book, or the white and the black books. And there can be several books for each and every practice. Um, yeah, what we're talking about in here, about positive, uh, about uh, practices, competition practices that we might support, or practices that are uh, vile or that that require at least some uh, thoughts before going into them. Right? So probably you you not should you shouldn't do it. And there's an idea that we've been discussing um, um, in our committee and uh, the minister, Mr. Aldebregenov of the Eurasian Union. Um, he's the minister for competition. He supported this idea, and I think uh, it would be nice to discuss this uh, first uh, gathering the heads of anti-monopoly bodies of our member states. Uh, I, uh, the, 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 the soon this meeting will take place in Brest, in Belarus, on the 25th and 26th of June, 5 plus 1 format. And we must really think about creating a mechanism of training professional staff, because staff, people for anti-monopoly bodies, uh, isn't being trained today specifically or specially. There's some short courses that you can attend uh, in certain uh, high educational establishments, universities, and institutes. We have more of them here in Russia. Other member states have uh, less of them. In some member states, we don't have them at all. There's no training for competition law, uh, and there's no competition law or education. So this idea is, again, quite um, useful, and I think it should be brought up. What else I'd like to say? We will definitely need to create a textbook, uh, a textbook on competition law in the Eurasian Union. And I think this idea is going to be brought up uh, during the, this meeting between uh, anti-monopoly body heads, bodies heads um, in Brest. Uh, this idea is quite clear, and I think uh, all members of the Union have to take part in preparing the textbook. And definitely this textbook won't solve the real, well, won't solve the, the, the major problem, how to bring up good, decent uh, companies, uh, competitors, right? We, we already discussed it in here that uh, bringing up uh, good competition practices, you should do, you should start from a secondary school. Unfortunately, there are no special courses now, not in a single member state, in secondary schools or in primary schools, where people would be explained what competition is and how to treat this competition in the right and in a decent way, how to implement the uh, uh, Kant's uh, uh, categorical uh, imperative, who said, treat others like you want to be treated yourself. So for a competition, it's the basic construct that has to be followed. And I'm sure that... And I'm sure that we have very good and very interesting potential, uh, especially for schools. And I'd like to finalize in here, I'd like to finish. I think that starting from schools, from school years, we need to establish a vision in the heads of our future citizens, future consumers, that even if you don't recognize competition, or if even if you don't recognize competition law, competition law recognizes you, by the way, and you will still have to live and abide by those competition rules and procedures. And this is a necessity that you have to deal with. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Sir Game. I am asking all the speakers uh, to stick to the time limits because uh, we don't have uh, indefinite time. Using my right of the speaker, I 
want to ask you one question. Is the European Eurasian uh, Economic Commission, is, is it ready to discuss the international um, laws uh, or cases or did jury the commission is ready to do that uh, since last week all the legal documents have been enforced so okay we'll be waiting sergey maybe next year we'll draw some conclusions and see some results colleagues i would like to continue and to pass the floor to the partner of the brussels subdivisions of ledham and watkins lars kielbe mr kielbe I'm very happy to, to be here um, and, and share with you some thoughts on, on antitrust from a European perspective. I think the, the discussion this morning, which I found fascinating, shows that antitrust at the same time is local and global because you know, antitrust doesn't exist in a vacuum and therefore it needs to take account of what happens in the local jurisdiction. Uh, and we heard some examples from, some, from South Africa where employment is a particular con concern and antitrust to some extent takes that into account. Um, and we also heard calls for more international cooperation in antitrust because competition cases are incre increasingly global. You have global players that act uh, throughout the world and therefore you would say the enforcement community needs to have a, a response to that. And the question is how do you, you would say, align the local and global nature of, of antitrust. And I think the European experience you know, is, is a good one in that respect uh, because 10, 15 years ago, we had a system where there was enforcement at European level applying one set of rules and enforcement at national level applying their own national rules. And the European Union decided to create a common enforcement system, uh, which I happened to work on when I was working for the European Commission. Uh, we called it modernization. Uh, it became Regulation 1. And, and the trick that we did was to, in a sense, extend the European competition rules to the whole of the EU as a common set of laws or rules, so that every enforcer in Europe now applies the EU competition rules. Now, once you do that, you have a common standard, which I think you need to have if you want to have, you say, global cooperation and global enforcement, because you need to agree on what the basic principles of the game are. And if you have too much diversion in the principles that are applied, you will never get there. So a key is to have a common set of principles that the different enforcers can agree on. And, and what we did at the time was to agree inside the EU that the role of competition law was essentially to protect consumer welfare and economic efficiency. And by so doing, we also knew that we would have to cut a few objectives that fell outside of that area, such as, you say, employment or protection of the environment, so the more public interest objectives, because the wider the set of objectives that you have in your competition laws, the more scope there is for divergent application and the more, the, the more difficult it will become to actually have it was a common application of these rules. So in Europe, we took the decision to align on a common set of principles which was really focusing on protecting consumer welfare. But I think what is really important here and then I'll, I'll come to my topic, uh, which is EU energy policy and the relationship between energy policy and antitrust enforcement in the energy sector. I think what is really important here is that this kind of alignment on some core competition objectives doesn't mean that you, you lose the local touch. Antitrust can still be local in the sense that when you apply those rules, you very much take into account what the burning needs are in your society because that will determine the types of cases that you focus on when you apply the rules. And I think the, the EU energy sector and EU energy policy is a very good example of the interplay between 
you could say, overriding policy objectives in the EU and how that influences the focus of antitrust enforcement. So, and it also shows the, the importance of understanding the broader policy objectives when you want to understand why the EU acts in this or that way when applying uh, the competition rules. Because there is a very strong link between what the EU is trying to achieve as a European Union and as a policymaker, and what the EU does as, a, uh, as an antitrust, antitrust enforcer. And then we're back to this principle that you know, antitrust can be global and local at the same time. Um, so if we look at EU energy policy today, energy is a huge challenge for the European Union. Uh, and it has become an even bigger challenge in recent years, uh, essentially for two reasons. One is the shale gas revolution in the US that has reduced energy costs in the US uh, drastically compared to energy costs in the EU. So we are at a competitive disadvantage. So a key concern of Europe is to try to drive down the cost of energy. The other big theme at the moment is climate change uh, and trying to fight climate change, which has led the EU to invest heavily in renewables, which, as I'll come back to, has created enormous challenges for the EU energy system because uh, if you look at electricity generation, conventional generation doesn't make any money uh, and is very costly because you have funding to renewables, you have funding to uh, conventional generation now, which means that energy costs are being pushed up at a time when we really want to reduce them. And the European response is to try to come up with a comprehensive energy policy where the cornerstone of that is trying to create an integrated European energy market with as many supply sources plugged into that market as possible uh, because it promotes security of supply and competition at the same time. Um, and the reason why market integration and having many sources of supply into the EU is important is because if you look at Europe geography, uh, Europe's geography, we are plugged into three main sources of gas supply coming from three different directions. You have Algerian gas in the south, Norwegian gas in the north, and Russian gas in the east. And if you don't have an integrated market, you can't even sort of mix these three sources throughout the EU. So this has basically led the EU to, uh, over the last 10 years or so, to really focus on trying to create this integrated European energy market. And earlier uh, this year, the Commission made new um, or proposed new initiatives to really push in the direction of creating this internal market. And here on this slide, I just list a few of the, of the, of the key pieces, but you'll see that developing the internal market and, and diversifying supply uh, is a very important one. Another big challenge is that energy policy is EU and national at the same time, and the EU is trying to make the different authorities work better together, again with a view to making this internal energy market happen. So this is the, you can say, the broad objectives at European level. So how does that translate into antitrust enforcement? How, how does the broad EU energy policy objectives, how does that get worked into the priorities of the EU when they apply the competition rules in the energy sector? Well, for one, energy has been a priority of the EU, of EU antitrust enforcement for the last 10 years. There is no sector in which the Commission has adopted more decisions and started more cases than in the energy sector. So due to this very, very high priority of energy in general, the Commission has also said, 
when we decide what we do with our antitrust enforcement <coughs> resources, we put a lot of it in energy. And in terms of the issues that the Commission is addressing, well, you know, those issues pretty much reflect the policy concerns. Because one area that the Commission is now emphasizing is territorial restrictions. So contract provisions that would prevent the free flow of energy inside the EU. Because if you want to create an internal market with a free flow of gas and electricity, you can't accept that companies agree on restrictions on the cross-border flow of, of, uh, of energy. And at the moment, uh, the Commission is um, conducting, you read about that in the press, um, a case against Gazprom. And one of the areas that the Commission is looking at in that case is territorial restrictions to make sure that gas can flow freely uh, inside the EU. Now, if you want to have competitive markets inside the EU, you also need to have gas and power exchanges with well-functioning pricing mechanisms. So you want to have a market price for gas in your large internal market. So that's another area of focus of antitrust enforcement. Uh, the Gazprom case also involves pricing issues. The Commission has run cases against power exchanges uh, to make sure that they compete. Uh, the Commission has, is running a case in the oil sector regarding uh, oil benchmarks, again, to make sure that pricing uh, is competitive and say, free of, of restrictions. Uh, so again, just to illustrate that the policy objectives are reflected in the cases that are then brought under the competition rules. And similarly, in electricity markets, I mentioned that one of the big issues is um, renewables and how renewables have affected price formation in the EU and the functioning of the market. This is the second big, big issue in, 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 in Europe. Essentially what is happening is that uh, you know, renewables is quite expensive, let's face it. But in order to promote renewables in Europe, states have granted subsidies to have more renewables. But once you have renewables, they basically produce all the time because they're very cheap. You know, when the wind blows, the windmill runs, and the cost of running the windmill is zero. And that essentially means that these mills run whenever the wind blows, very cheaply, and they push out, therefore, other sources of generation like coal-fired and gas-fired power plants. So when the wind blows, you don't need your gas-fired power plant. But when the wind doesn't blow, you need something else, because otherwise the lights will go out. So then you need your gas-fired power plants. And essentially what has happened is that because there is so much renewable energy and the wind blows quite a lot, but not all the time, the gas-fired power plants are not running as much as they did and they're not making very much money. Which has caused member states now to say, well, we need to pay the owners of the gas-fired power plants subsidies so that they stay in the market. And the Commission is now very concerned that this will increase the price of energy in Europe and also create small national sub-markets in the EU, which runs contrary to this idea of having a, uh, an integrated market. So what the Commission has done now is launch a sector inquiry under European competition rules to try to figure out how to fix this problem. So competition rules are being used actively to push the internal market agenda, both in gas, oil, and electricity, to basically push the European policy objectives uh, through antitrust enforcement. So again, I think European energy policy is a very good example of how you can, you can say, reconcile the say, need to have 
to take local problems into account while having a common set of rules in the EU that everybody applies, which is very important for business because they know that wherever they operate in the EU, the antitrust rules are being applied in pretty much the same way so that you have consistency. And then you don't have this distorting effect that was mentioned earlier that companies go to the weakest, the country with the weakest enforcement, right? And, and you know, for that reason, I find, you, in a sense, you are just starting now in the CIS countries the process that we embarked on in, in Europe uh, 10, 15 years ago. Of course, with maybe the big difference that we had the European competition rules there for many, many years, which already then were somehow the benchmark. And, and you have the very interesting challenge of having to build this from the ground up. Uh, but I think if you have a, you could say, customs union with free movement, it's really important to have common rules of the game and a common set of antitrust principles, I think, can go a long way in helping regulate this larger uh, area. That's certainly the, the, the lesson from Europe. So thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Kölbe. I wanted to uh, give uh, an opportunity for Mr. Artemyev to ask a question. Well, firstly, I wanted to say that the Eurasian Commission and our customs union rules are very similar to the European Commission rules because uh, the European Commission rules uh, were actually uh, uh, the source and we have ratified a single set of anti-monopoly rules. You s are right, uh, we do start from the scratch, but we have already created a legislative base. You've been working at the European Commission, I've been closely watching the Gazprom case, but one of uh, the charges by European Commission was that Gazprom tied its price to the price of oil, to NAFTA. Then the price was very expensive, over $100 per barrel, and Norwegians are dealt in spot markets, and because of that, their prices were lower. But now the prices on oil have precipitated, but now Gazprom will offer the cheapest prices because the oil prices have gone down. Do you think that will change the position? I know there are other charges against Gazprom, but now this uh, charge doesn't apply. I don't think it will. Uh, change the, the, the orientation or the Commission's view on the case because the, the real issue is not so much say, the, the level of the price, it's rather that if you want to have competitive markets for gas in Europe, you know, the price of gas should be determined by, in a sense, the market value of gas and not the, not the market value of some other commodity, in this case oil. And, and what has happened in Europe is that, at least in certain parts of Europe, particularly in, in Western Europe, gas hubs with, you would say, market-based price setting for gas have developed. And you then end up with a somewhat strange situation that, you would say, in part of the supply chain, namely the upstream part of the supply chain, uh, the price of gas is determined by the price of oil and in the downstream part of the supply chain at the level of the customer, it's increasingly determined by the price of, you know, the, the, the hub price of gas. And it creates a, it was a disconnect in the supply chain. And so that's one concern. The other concern is that, you know, in order for, you know, markets to develop in Europe, you need to have well-functioning gas hubs that determine the, the price of, of gas. And uh, at least in Europe, it's seen as an obstacle to that if you have pricing based on, 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 on a different commodity rather than the commodity which you actually sell, which is gas. So I don't think that at a, at a high level of you know, European energy policy uh, that it really changes because what the objective is to have 
say, gas prices set by hubs and not by the international oil price. Thank you very much. One more question we can take, and that's it. And please ask them in the mic. Please ask your question in the mic. Uh, you mentioned that criticizing basically some other countries' approaches, uh, mentioning South Africa, for example, as considering public interest uh, in antitrust enforcement. You were saying that in Europe you achieved kind of uh, narrowing down all the antitrust enforcement to one purpose, consumer welfare. But then when you were discussing energy policy, you said price doesn't really matter. We are caring about structure of the market in case of Gazprom, for example. When Gazprom was selling price cheaper than the uh, other suppliers and steel was criticized because you don't like the structure of market. Then you said market development is important because we want in future achieve certain purposes in energy market and in, in structure of the market in Europe. So basically you were saying about the same arguments, public interest arguments, but, uh, but in South African case, for example, it's employment. In some other developing world, it's something else, environmental issues. But in European case, you're saying about structure of the market, about development of the energy structure and stuff and stuff. Basically basically uh, also avoiding your same uh, purpose to reach only consumer welfare. Isn't it this? Thanks. Many thanks. Very, very good question. Uh, very good. What I said is that you know, the broader the base of objectives that you pursue with antitrust rules, the harder it will be to have international convergence. Right? Because the more there will be disagreement between regulators on what objectives to pursue. So I think that's a slightly different, different angle to it. And, and my view is that you say, if, you, if you have to stretch the boundaries of antitrust law to catch a public interest aim, maybe you shouldn't use antitrust law to achieve that aim. Maybe you should leave that to another law that specifically addresses it. Now, to your, your question on uh, energy markets, well, the, the, I think that, that the, well, the role of antitrust is to protect well-functioning markets. And that is not in itself a question of the level of the price or the, whether it's high or low. It is that the price is set by a well-functioning market which is competitive. And if the price of a commodity is high because it has a high value in the market and maybe higher value than oil, then the price of gas should actually be higher than oil. And it may be that in the short term, you could say it's not good for consumers because they have to pay a higher price for their gas. On the other hand, you know, it is also the higher price of the gas that in the long run will push for changes in the market in terms of energy efficiency and so on. So, you know, why should you burn gas at an artificially low level of price if the market demands a higher price for that gas? I mean, from a, from a point of view of, of, of market economics and, and, and welfare uh, and efficiency, you know, the price of a product should reflect its market value. And I think that should be the, the main guiding principle of what antitrust authorities do. If a government then thinks that the price of gas is too high, well, this is something that I don't like, but then they may consider introducing price controls. But, n but not to you know, use antitrust to control the price, because I think it goes against what the basic principle of antitrust is, which is let's have efficient and well-functioning markets, and they will determine the price. Arguments would be justified because employment also influences price in the long run and, and, and environment as well and everything else. You know, basically, then you just destroy your equilibrium. But again, I'm getting back to my point that if you want to have a common set of rules in a uh, market that, in which many authorities apply the rules, you know, the, the more objectives you include, the more you have divergent rules views on the importance of those objectives. So if you take the EU, and let's say that you would include uh, employment and environment and lots of sorts of other objectives, then the Germans might say, well, you know, we emphasize employment. The French might say, well, we in emphasize environment. And the Italians will say something else. And then you have, on the basis in Europe, of the same set of rules, very divergent decisions 
which is you say horrible from a business perspective because you don't know what the same rule means in France or in Germany or in Italy. So if you move to a system with common rules, you know, then you have to, in my view, agree on a common set of or a common understanding of what those rules mean because otherwise you end up in this horrible situation that, well, in the case of Europe, Article 101 or 102 means something different in Germany and in Italy and France. And that undermines the system. And if you don't, you say, like that, then you shouldn't have a common set of competition rules. But then we're back to, you say, the objective of international convergence, which personally I think is a very good one because business is international and therefore the rules of the game you know, the more common they are, the better. But I'm just saying that if you move in that direction, it comes at a cost, which I don't think is too dramatic because I think that in most cases, the cases you want to do, you can do under the competition rules. And if you can't, leave it to some other law. Thank you very much, Mr. Kolbe. I think your presentation really incited the audience and a short comment from Igor. I really like what you said because it evoked a really live interest from the public and we see that there's some debates going on even in Russia. What's more important? A better uh, organized market, the price. Um, the only thing that I would load, when a law enforcer, an anti-monopoly body says that this kind of structure of the market is more right and then sets a different set of indicators, it actually leads to a different price. So as soon as you say that, well, for example, the, go the gas is going to be priced in accordance with spot uh, transactions and not oil or any other indicators that exist in the market. And when you say that they are better for the market, you define the price yourself. The price will definitely vary in times, of course, depending on the market uh, situation, various levers and leverages. But it's the regulator who is going to set the price. Uh, it, will, it will set it as a floating one, but its limits will depend on the indicator. We also do it using various formulas. We have uh, formulas pricing but we then understand that certain rules are being set by us so as soon as the method is considered by someone right and by others not right it leads to different rules of pricing and it leads to different prices and that's done by the state regulator by an anti monopoly body well in the case of Euro Commission it's Nelly Commission like Nelly Cruz did right for roaming just one decision well, a certain limit of roaming was set and then all the prices dropped and fell and precipitated. But that was right. But again, it's the regulator who was setting up this limit. So thank you very much. You really incited the audience and you make it at least live and probably some wake woke up. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Thanks a lot. And I really personally thankful to you for that. Okay, thank you very much. We need to move forward. And I'd like to give the floor to the chairman of the General Council, Non-for-Profit Partnership for Competition Support, Anna uh, we really want to listen to your opinion because you're an expert and you're the chairperson of a non-for-profit partnership and we want to see your view over the problems we have in antitrust laws and antitrust regulations. Thank you very much, our non-for-profit partnership for the contribution and uh, uh, support of competition. It's not my main business and it's not my main thing. I'm also working in Igor Puginsky Afanasyev and Partnery Bar uh, company. Today this non-for-profit partnership unites more than 100 economists and lawyers, Nikolai Vaznesensky, Tatiana Kaminsky and many others who I see here in this audience are members of this non-for-profit partnership. And uh, many of the amendments that were made uh, to the fourth anti-monopoly package during the second reading in the Duma were prepared thanks to our experts and it was quite an interesting work. It's a continuation of the work we started already back in 2007. So today what I would like to talk about is a topic uh, private and public interest in anti-monopoly uh, regulation. Uh, this topic has been briefly touched upon and we just scratched the surface during the first part of the session, but my presentation is not an official position of either the Bureau nor the partnership. It's just a personal, I'm talking here uh, in my personal capacity. This topic is quite, uh, quite intense uh, and I would uh, like to talk about two theses mainly, two presumptions. Anti-monopoly regulation always uh, violates private interests. Yeah. <sighs> 
and always uh, squeezes out private interests and the regulator cannot live in a political vacuum right so i would like to talk about how private interests are being violated uh, and i'll give a couple of cases and i will try to uh, tell what kind of uh, things will help to find a balance and to strike a balance between private and public interests so why this topic has been brought up in this forum because for the last several years our conferences and seminars roundtables uh, they're more about practice and they're more about applied things we're discussing some very um, specific things some very specific norms and regulations draft laws and bills and so on and so forth but i think there is a necessity today and there is a need uh, to uh, elaborate certain standards, guidelines, or schools of thought by our regulators. You know that there's a Harvard School of Harvard, School of uh, Chicago, uh, that deals with anti-monopoly laws and anti-monopoly practice. And when the representatives of the school speak, uh, you really see what kind of interests uh, they defend. And I think that there's a need, uh, that this need has recently appeared, to develop uh, the set of standards, or the set of rules. And I think um, uh, the fact that this topic is being brought up uh, at uh, a conference of this level it is uh, uh, an evidence uh, that uh, this uh, question is uh, huge and again a regulator is not living in a political vacuum and our country is not moving in its own special way anti-monotoly policy um, uh, follows some historical and some political agenda and uh, mr shushkevich uh, recently published a book and he analyzed the objectives of anti-monopoly regulations in the us and he compared it with russia the antitrust law in the US and in Russia. Uh and in the 70s and the 60s they were uh, of the 20th century they were national champions so to say in europe uh, those uh, um, authors of the rome treaty that uh, uh, give gave birth to the european union didn't say anything about the business concentration and some people believe it was made not by chance because because they were afraid of the frig fragility of the European market uh, uh, the way it was in the past. And the legislators were trying to defend the market of the European Union from those strong US uh, majors and companies. And by the end of the 80s, yes, for a long time, uh, this economic concentration issues, they remained under the jurisdiction of national anti-monopoly bodies. And only uh, when this consolidation happened, uh, many large transactions were approved and the European Committee produced the first document by which it regulated these issues and by which uh, they set up uh, requirements for economic uh, uh, concentrations or business concentrations before I launch into my presentation I would like to say that our lawyers community still discusses this combination between private and public law and many scientists many experts uh, say that uh, made uh, comments that should we really divide uh, entrepreneurial law as something uh, separate uh, but it justifies an unjust interference of the state into the sphere so that's that's an argument against so violation of private interest that's what i'm going to talk about right now anti-monopoly law now lives under the edge of the um, public law where the state dominates and in our case the state protects public interest it protects competition uh, law, legal entities uh, controlled in this way by the state should abide by all the prospective measures and all the uh, requirements of the law sub laws and the norms of the regulator but i would like to remind you uh, what uh, ancient roman lawyers used to say about the private and the public law use publicum privatorum so the private a public law cannot be changed when attracting private entities so public law is an imperative norm and it prescribes the market participants uh, the way they should behave as opposed to private legal practices where there's a goodwill and private initiative um, many agreements are based on a legally binding agreement between separate legal entities so if we look at uh, well just uh, 
Yeah, the, the situation of violation of interests, for example, conflict of interests, uh, violation of uh, dominance position, uh, unfair competition, uh, economic concentration deals, cartel, and so on and so forth. To my mind, uh, when Article 10 is applied, uh, uh, violation of dominant position, uh, the violation of private interests is the strongest here. Uh, and I will explain. Uh, any company is developing uh, naturally by its wish to get a bigger market share to maximize its profits and to maximize its returns and uh, usually companies uh, tap uh, neighboring markets but the object of regulation here in Russia and in Europe, uh, Europe are the unfair actions or activities uh, and that separates us and that differs us from the US where monopolization is really prohibited or any attempts of the monopolization are prohibited by themselves so Uh, protection of competition, protection of people whose interests were violated requires the change in the market behavior of uh, a regulating body. So the regulator has either to change pricing uh, or take certain obligations on itself, say, or, or, or prescribe and force certain obligations on a dominant. So a dominant must step away from his personal interests and the public uh, worth. And when and talking about unfair competition, the regulator here protects the market from the activities and actions of other players in one or in several and neighboring markets. For example, when implementing the ban uh, on unfair competition, it protects one player from unfairness of other players. So the question that still remains open uh, until today, where does this freedom of contract and private initiative end and violation of law starts? Uh, all the articles I've just listed, uh, they're common in one thing. An anti-monopoly body, when it requests something or requires, it has to do a retrospective analysis. Uh, those requests or requirements usually contain measures to ensure competition, uh, fair competition in the future. So, the regulator has a very difficult task at hand. He must, or it must, has certain um, forecasting skills, and it must really see how this uh, measures uh, that he inflicts uh, will act on the market in the future. So, the regulator strives to restore the situation, usually, uh, which was violated in the market by a certain legal entity, right? But today we deal with a different situation like a year ago. So, in certain th in, in, in a certain way, a regulator cements the market. And that's why this acute discussion usually starts between the regulators and the business, because the business want to protect their behavior, they want to protect their market strategy, uh, professing and administering their rights. Now, if we talk about these uh, transactions for economic concentration, as opposed to all other articles, uh, when we talk about economic concentration, uh, we deal with economical analysis of the market. So the regulator assesses the impact of the transaction over the market, which has been uh, in, in where the transaction is taking place or which the transaction is um, targeting. So again, he's thinking about the future and uh, the participants of this transaction, their future is being explained by the regulator. So the transaction is either continued with certain conditions and limitations or uh, the parties to the transaction will go away from the transaction itself. That's why the regulator well, there are not so many questions to the regulator when it comes to economic concentrations, and the parties are not usually offended about the prescriptions of the regulator. Now, how to find the balance between the private and the public interest? I would like to remind you that to protect the private interest, you don't... Uh, well, only one body is not enough. There has to be a, a developed institute, a developed body that is responsible for... E uh, for the way these institutions are being implemented. For example, court protection system. They all should work fine. And an anti-monopoly body shouldn't replace other bodies, shouldn't replace the, um, um, the mistakes and errors made by other bodies. So, about the future anti-monopoly policy, we need uh, to constantly conduct ex post uh, assessment of the uh, draft 
norms and uh, draft laws in the sphere of competition. Here, I would like to tackle the uh, experience of OECD, uh, which is actually actively discussing this problem at its uh, meetings. It's a global pro problem because everyone um, has to define uh, the limit to which the state may uh, interfere in public-private uh, relationships and uh, to continue with that strategy of uh, the ex post uh, assessment strategy. We need to ask an, um, uh, and answer a number of questions about the following. For the older companies, for the companies that have been in the market for a long time, it's necessary to assess the cost necessary to provide uh, abidance by the uh, regulations and to that end they need to ask to answer whether this is variable or fixed cost uh, how they compare with the annual revenue and whether big or small companies are more affected with the new equipment or with older equipment and if that decision is made uh, if that law is passed uh, may it happen that the company disappears from the market it's necessary to uh, assess how those uh, regulations limit the entrance to the market for new companies or to the companies that have recently diversified. So they have some uh, equipment already, but they are new in this market. How that will really affect the prices paid by the consumers, uh, whether the production cost will grow, how that will influence the innovations, how that will influence adjoining or related markets, how that will impact labor problems. If the anti-monopoly service uh, is able to create such a questionnaire and the Commission will be able to answer all those questions, I think that will help us to correctly assess the impact of that decision on the market. Another measure that I would like to propose is to shift the focus of the anti-monopoly service to uh, economic concentration uh, transactions as a preventive measure to uh, reduce competition in European practice. This is paid a lot of attention to and they do a lot of an analysis uh, so that later there are fewer cases when we have to counter the behavior of a dominant company. and. So if uh, the anti-monopoly service will do that when setting up new enterprises, that will uh, be uh, conducive to shifting that accent. I want to warn, again, ben, based on the uh, OCD experience, about uh, deficiencies or possible necessity to correct uh, the policy in this area, or rather to make a proposal to remove uh, from uh, the law on competition. Uh, the OECD analyzed the practice and recognizes that in many countries companies are exempt uh, from uh, abidance by competitive laws uh, in order to better develop export or to better develop SMEs uh, to develop uh, agricultural um, cooperatives, or, but these companies are warned against uh, such exemptions and they refer to the experience of collective exemption in the sphere of uh, auto dealer dealing. Those collective exemptions were present in the EU and as a result uh, a system developed whereby the producers increased their domination and did not let the dealers are to sell uh, their competitors' cars. I would also want to warn that the anti-monopoly service stimulates the participants in the market to, to self-regulate. Nevertheless, we must keep control over such associations or self-regulating organizations because the negative effect may ensue from that. That doesn't 
increase competition, develop competition, but it also provides for an exchange of sensitive information. And quite often, such SROs prevent new players from entering the market. And OCD uh, actually describes the experience of the antitrust service of uh, the United States in 1988 when the association set a certain standards of uh, steel sleeves uh, for power lines and those standards were entered into the regional safety rules but when a new company created a cheap uh, plastic uh, uh, sleeve, uh, the association just didn't let them come into the market. Finishing my presentation, I would like to come back to this uh, very highly philosophical subject of uh, difficulty of trying that balance, but I think that you will be able to do that, and it would be con interesting to continue uh, our work in this uh, area. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you very much. Uh, now I think we are doomed to finding that balance. If the market finds a balance between supply and demand, we will be able to do that too. One question. Rogachevsky Baltica Brewery. I think a very interesting presentation. Thank you. But it's not rather not a question, but a remark and a proposal. Yes, the competitive behavior is uh, not a winding road, it's a multi-lane road, and the regulator and the economic entities uh, move along it. And maybe what was very interesting is that you mentioned that the economic entities, the companies, must help create the competition rules, and maybe we should think of including into all the new prescriptions to make the companies create a systems of anti-monopoly compliance, at least to those who submit uh, requests on economic concentration. So if you don't tidy up in your own home, uh, we will, well, I would also uh, introduce more democratic practices into, uh, democratic norms into uh, Trade practices. Yes, we wanted uh, that uh, anti-monopoly compliance, but the businesses are really cri were critical of that idea. Now we have that room, but we do not use it very often. The businesses do not always want that, and we are not always right when we ask them to disclose their trade policies. There are two sides to this, but there must be more democracy in the prescriptions. Thank you. We are moving on. We've been talking about approaches to the uh, criminal regulation of uh, anti-monopoly, and I would like to pass the floor to Alexei Dabrinin, who is a barrister and who works in pen and paper company. Good afternoon, esteemed colleagues. Thank, I will thank the organizers of the forum for the opportunity to speak. My presentation will be dedicated to the legal and uh, legal issues of criminal persecution of uh, violations in anti-monopoly sphere. Why criminal law? Practice shows that within the framework of the criminal cases of the it is only with, uh, after criminal cases are instigated uh, the uh, defendants uh, would recompense uh, the uh, loss uh, incurred as a result of their activities I will have two items. I will be speaking about the actual decriminalization of Article 178, uh, which establishment uh, criminal liability for violating anti-monopoly rules. And also I will be speaking about the electronic trade. I will start with the first item. I participated in this conference last year with my colleagues from the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service and we've discussed several ways of improving uh, the uh, ways of application of Article 178. It makes no sense now to discuss the same subject for the simple reason that the article was decriminalized. 
in essence. How did that happen? On the 8th of March, the President signed a bill on amending Article 178, and as a result, a lot of uh, actions which were previously classified as crime have been removed. If you could, uh, for instance, charge people with criminal liability in a case of a cartel or prevention of competition or uh, misuse of a dominant position and incurring huge losses, nowadays it's only the limitation of co competition that ensues a criminal case. In a, in a situation of a cartel, now uh, the legislator has raised the threshold. Uh, it was one million, now it's ten million. Now uh, the major, uh, well, our courts uh, actually, even before, did not uh, know how to use uh, this article. And in this situation, we cannot expect more criminal cases. Last year we had only one such case and uh, the federal uh, federal uh, anti-monopoly uh, service sent in over 400, uh, uh, submitted over 400 cases to the courts and there were uh, eight cases and on, there was only one sentence in Novgorod. Well, the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service, the FAS, actively works uh, on uh, bringing those cases to court. Uh, last year there were over 2,000 administrative cases uh, on uh, misuse of dominant position in the market, and the second half was cartel agreements. And a lot of those cases are potentially criminal cases because Article 178, or rather Article 178 before its amendments, is absolute, absolutely mirrors the administrative uh, 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 co uh, the administrative um, article. So uh, FAS is working, but in the reality of today, I tend to think that the article is actually decriminalized. Probably this could be amended, and I spoke about that, and I think there's only one option, and that is to give the authority to start criminal cases and to investigate exclusively to the FAS, to the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service, because statistics shows that this service manages to collect evidence and even submit the cases uh, to the courts, but uh, they are really toothless and cannot do anything. The new edition, the new version, probably will lead to no sentences at all. So in that sense, certainly the rights of the participant of the commodity market have been violated or infringed upon because uh, the only article in the criminal code does not protect them any longer. A second problem that we came across was the violation of the market participants' rights during the bankruptcy procedure at electronic trade, not during uh, the uh, auction itself, not during the tender procedure itself, but when the price is decreasing, the FAS is actually uh, actively fighting those practices uh, based on the article on the protection of our competition. So they annul the result of the tender, they applied other sanctions, but from the criminal law does not regulate uh, those relationships at all. And us, uh, we as uh, barristers, cannot protect uh, the rights of uh, the participants of an electronic tender. There is no article which would assess uh, the activities of uh, participants of a tender, of an electronic tender, uh, who came into agreement with the organizer of the tender. There is no article that says that uh, this is a crime. This is not fraud. This is not art, uh, inflicting uh, damage. Uh, it is not theft. 
So, because of that, we propose to bridge this gap. The article will be called 178.1, Prime 1. And it will be called limiting competition during the electronic tender procedure. And it will be formulated like that. A purposeful violation of uh, the uh, procedure of electronic uh, trade and also storage of means of uh, information process and storage or passing such information uh, to the trade uh, platforms if that inflicted damage or to the interest or, or, or the interest of uh, persons uh, organizations or uh, state when I found one of the trade sites I called them and uh, asked my colleagues uh, to comment on the article that my colleagues and I have formulated. Because they work in this area, they better know what violations take place. An hour later, I got a call and I heard panic on the other end of the line. And, I, and people asked, Alexei, when was that article incorporated into the criminal code? I said, don't worry, we are still developing it. There was uh, a really a... Uh, outcry of joy and uh, I was told that uh, this uh, article is uh, really something very dangerous, something raw, and, but this uh, probably means that uh, we have developed a very good ar article. Thank you. Thank you, Alexei. I believe that uh, the proposals on uh, making criminal policy more stringent do deserve further discussion because uh, the efficiency of the current criminal system uh, causes a lot of questions, but we should not overdo it. I should say that uh, our key spe note speaker, uh, Igor Artyanov, has to leave us because of his timetable. I would like to apologize uh, to Tatiana because I did not hear her presentation, but I hope to hear it in the nearest future when we get back uh, together uh, at the non-commercial partnership. Yes, uh, we can't say that it was an easy day for us. Uh, we did not enjoy, well, we enjoyed ourselves, but we did not uh, waste time because uh, what we did demanded a certain effort. But what happened? There's a lot of new th interesting things. We cannot monitor everything that our barristers and our foreign partners are doing. And different practices uh, cause discussions. But it's a great thing that we all get together to the legal forum. We all get together in one place. We pack ourselves into this room for several hours. There were so many people that there were no vacant seats here, but this is very useful. We hear one another, we make conclusions, and I would like to apologize. Well, there is no democracy in the executive power, so I have to leave. I, haven't, I cannot change anything. I was ordered to follow a certain trajectory today, but I want to thank our friends who came from abroad our hearty thanks to you. You've covered a lot of distance to bring our ideas to us, and we are grateful. And cer certainly I would like to thank the organizers who organized everything very well. It's no surprise because this uh, platform is one of uh, major places for us. The journalists have heard us. Oh, they will write a lot. We have been heard by all the people who deal with that, including universities, students, judges. Uh, the law enforcers, and uh, I think that we've achieved a lot of success. Once again, I apologize for having to leave, but I bow to you once again. Thank you very much, Igor. Dear colleagues, and now we're moving towards the final presentation. I hope you will remember it, because it's the last one, truly. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be the most interesting one as well. Now I'd like to give the floor to a managing partner of a legal part, uh, company, Kamenska & Partners, Tatiana Kamenskaya.
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm sure that all presentations here have been very interesting because they cover many facets of the same problem. But today we've talked a lot about the role of social and uh, economic role of an anti-monopoly body, a regulator. When we were developing those amendments to the law on competition, we had two concepts to follow. The first concept we entitled the consumer, and the second concept is the one we have to live now today, uh, to live with now today. So the first concept was basically based on the international experience, and in many um, European ca countries, it says that it's the consumer who is less protected, and everything that violates consumers' rights, uh, everything that uh, violates uh, consumers' behavior, it violates the competition. So our anti-monopoly body uh, decided that we are not supporting the right of a consumer to be an idiot. That's why a consumer is a smart person. He can protect himself. So let's just leave the things that are already ripe. I mean, the things in this... Uh, um, in this aspect and we'll, we, we won't just allow the consumer to be misled for example when a company says that we offer that many goods but when the consumer came there are only two products available or a restaurant and I can't give you the name or actually I can uh, so one of the restaurants said uh, we want to be called the Ministry of Agriculture and we said to them you can't use the, the name of a, of a state body uh, and the regulator told us uh, come on who will come to a restaurant thinking that they are entering a ministry no one would do this because our consumers are smart they told us so that's the presumption we were based on and uh, what we are trying to pretend, uh, protect is the competition itself and not the consumer. And that's what we are different with European. So who is the subject? The subject is the consumer. That's in Europe. In uh, our situation, in our country, the situation is different. And that's why we have what we have. But I believe that this concept is also good and great because it considers and it takes into account the fact that we have to integrate with the, the European Union, so we integrate the European experience. This concept allows us to fix uh, uh, court and administrative practices and it introduces certain changes. So before uh, the changes to the corpus delicti. Uh, we've been talking to the court of arbitration, actually. Aksana here, uh, we talked a lot with her. So we thought that it's going to help us a lot when implementing the anti-monopoly law. And whether it will help us uh, when implementing the anti-monopoly law, she said, yes, it will. So what are we doing now? We're not just changing the norm of law. We're changing the whole institution. Who has the who has the clicker? Who owns the power to the computer? No one? Okay. Oh, thank you, Alexei. So nice of you. So, if in present unfair competition in accordance with the current legislation shall uh, abide by four principles, first, any activity of the subject must be considered unfair. Uh, these uh, activities must be uh, profit-driven when dealing with uh, businesses. Then this activity must violate the law or or and the norms of uh, uh, fairness and decentness and so on. And it should also lead and it, and it has to lead to damages or damages to reputation, material damages or damages to material reputation. Article 10 of the Paris Convention provides for a broader scope of uh, uh, violations. Uh, for example, violating uh, the rights and the, the, the guy in the booth says that I'm uh, keeping with the pace okay. So now all those uh, things are very broad and very vast. That's why it was the court practice uh, to formulate these things and the anti-monopoly policy uh, was doing it as well. Uh, 
So, um, in order to understand whether any activities of a business violates the law, we've uh, developed this particular scheme uh, and this uh, process. Well, first, uh, the question that has to be answered, are you competitors with some other legal entity? Well, this question is not directly following, but this question is quite crucial because we have one particular article and one particular violation where this fact doesn't matter at all. So. Any activity will be considered an unfair competition, even if your competitor is uh, in a different market. And I will tell about that later. So what do we have in here? So there's some misconception. Well, uh, leading to misconception. Leading to misconception, it's Article 14.1. It... Uh, actually, sorry, it's Article 2, but it uh, reflects Article 14.1. Uh, so, leading to misconception, two points. First, leading to misconception can only be possible if we are talking about your own goods and your own activities, and if you are talking about the, the things that the legal entity does. And this list is not exhaustive yet, oh, sorry, it's open, it's left to uh, amendments. Next, incorrect comparison. What do we mean by incorrect comparison? When you uh, um, compare the characteristics of your goods or com characteristics of, of your competitor, which will give you an, an advantage position. Incorrect comparison. Here I'd like to note two things. First, uh, it can be negative and positive. Negative incorrect uh, comparison is when you emphasize your dominance by using the weak points of the other legal entity. And second, and the positive uh, there's a positive incorrect comparison. So when you're using business reputation for your own means and for your own purposes, and in this way you grow your profits and in this way you grow your revenues. Uh, in unfair competition related to procurement and use of an exclusive right for the means of individualization. So it's basically the same article it used to be, or at least it's the same part of it. No. Actually, we're introducing one more exception in here. The exception that hadn't ever existed in the Russian uh, Federation in the Russian legislation. For example, when you use business reputation of a particular company that is not your competitor but actually uh, plays in a different uh, commodity market, it will still be considered as an act of unfair competition. Uh, what was the source of this law? You might remember the Vacheron Constantin case, a very famous one, when the trademark Vacheron Constantin registered uh, a trademark. Uh, using the international classifier group number 25. It registered its trademark for the watch category, but there were some entrepreneurs, some business people, because you know um, competitors, especially unfair competitors, are people creative. They decided to register the same trademark, but for shoes. And that's why the anti-monopoly body couldn't use uh, our anti-monopoly law, and we had to use the Paris Convention uh, on trademark on trademarks. So if we did this after those particular changes are made in the legislation, then probably we would have used uh, Part Three, Article Fourteen. Uh, so paragraph two. So I, as an expert, have a couple of questions. Is it really correct to call it an unfair competition? Because uh, there's no basic principles. These two guys and these two companies are not competitors to each other, right? One is in shoes, the other one is in watches. So when we were developing these particular amendments, we decided to call it not an unfair competition, but we decided just to ban it. Well, whatsoever. But some experienced guys from other bodies of our government corrected us, and we've agreed it with our regulator. The anti-monopoly body agreed to us, but there was... Uh, and I think we acted uh, um, in the same front line. Now, we, saw, we, we said that you shouldn't use, and we mustn't use this... Um, uh, well, we, we should ban it, right? Uh, this construct still remains. It's called unfair competition, but we specifically say that uh, this is an activity of a legal entity against another legal entity operating in a different market. And what we also rem uh, included there is not just buying but using. It's not just uh, uh, buying a trademark and putting it on the wall. You must use it. And only if you use this trademark, right, then this activity can be considered as an unfair competition. The next article already exists now. It's point four, article 14, unfair competition related to uh, in illegal use of the results of uh, intellectual activity, uh, excluding means of individualization, because there were many juxtapositions in the past. No, only when we use the results of the intellectual activity, that, then, uh, then this law applies. 
on as this article applies and again the good and the commodity has to be put into circulation has to put has to be put in uh, the goods uh, turnover otherwise uh, we won't register the act of viol uh, violation I I'd like to come back to the means of individualization because here this principle applies theoretically the law is not violated right a company may act in the right way by buying and by uh, registering uh, their rights as a right holder of a particular means of individualization but if the company acted in the right in the really right way they wouldn't and they, they wouldn't um, register this means of individualization for themselves but to really replicate the trademark of its competitor some new information for you now uh, disclosing uh, uh, sensitive information, business information is considered an act of unfair competition. Still, there are questions of how to apply this article because this regime of commercial secrets is questionable because you can make everything a secret. You can just put a number of stamps on a document and say that this is classified. But uh, just leaving this uh, document on the table already declassifies this, right? So we are still, we've introduced this corpus delicti, we're trying to support it, but there's a big question of how it's going to be enforced. And Another article that we separate as a separate violation, uh, as a different violation, it's called... Yes, two things, sorry. Discreditation and unfair competition related to... Uh, really, uh, well, we know about this. Uh, leading to misconception is uh, uh, point one, Article 4, Part 2. If you are praising yourself, that's leading to misconception, right? But if you are um, throwing dirt to somebody else, that's discreditation, right? Just for you to understand. And mixing. What's mixing? Mixing is interesting because we've added another thing here. Uh, previously, uh, you could say that it's a mixed packaging on a good, for example, or you can say that the good itself is a mixture uh, of whatever. But today we say that uh, today we say that you can do business by not just creating goods. You can do it by creating certain image of a company, by creating certain conditions in which company operates. What? Uh, uh, what's about the image? Uh, the image is everything. The, the, the shop the company operates in, uh, the things they put in their window shop, and so on and so forth. So if you want to really reflect, if you want to uh, look like another company, for example, a brand name or whatever, say X5 Retailer Group, or let's say the drugstore 36.6 is doing it, they have their own decoration of a shop, right? If you want to be similar, if you want to look like this, uh, for example, and you open up a store in the Moscow region or anywhere else in Russia and you open a store which is, looks like and is very similar to a big name right and you do whatever it takes uh, to decorate it in the way that uh, a certain brand does for their stores that's going to be considered as a violation of this law and this particular article yes discreditation yes what's that's what I'm that's what I'm saying copying or imitation that, uh, that that I explained already here we have an American example that we give you just to show that previously uh, the use of this legislation wasn't that easy because uh, we used to have two well uh, we used to have two trademarks in the past spy silence and spice valley well this is a particular case I'm uh, talking about now uh, if we try to take this case here in the Russian courts I think it would be really hard to Mm, apply the law in here because but now well if we if we use the previous law 14.3 and 14.5 it would be much more convenient because that's an illegal acquisition of intellectual and uh, intellectual property even if you're dealing with a, uh, a neighboring market now what I would like to say here this is some interesting facts and some interesting cases I'm just showing uh, again let's talk about trademark how can you really see that a competitor is really violating your rights or not violating your rights with your trademark. Uh, we've taken an American approach when we deal with our cases. We want to assess a power of a trademark. What's a trademark power? Actually, how uh, great it can stand out or how public perceives this trademark and does it really attribute this trademark to a producer? Uh, then... Um, um, equality of the trademarks, how they differ or how they similar. 
uh, and not like our so, so uh, like um, some uh, statistic company uh, companies do it. No, the different thing. When an American company says, when we show a fake, do you really have association with an original? If a consumer says that yes, it's the same producer uh, and it's the same manufacturer, it's just a promotion or just some mi minor, minor changes to the trademark, then it's a fact of counterfeit. Uh, then you also have to look at the specificity of sales and specificity of consumers because you, you, you deal with different categories of consumers of course uh, and you have to consider the pricing thing here because if your product costs 100 and the other product costs 1000 it's really hard to prove that they are competing one with each other unless it's a full uh, copying uh, marketing channels points of sales the goods that are being sold and the goods that are fighting against the uh, one each other are they at the same shelf or are they at different shelves or different parts of the store the usage of the same marketing channel imagine one company spends thousands and thousands of dollars a year or millions of millions and the other company does nothing just says we're like them but cheaper or just stays close on the shelf and says i have a difference of four rubles uh, but the good is uh, basically the same and uh, the intent of a respondent when choosing the trademark it's very important because a company producer of a counterfeit good of a fake needs to prove do they have a legend? Uh, why they've introduced this trademark? Maybe it was their live dream to introduce and to uh, create this trademark. It doesn't matter that TNKBP has done the same. And I can justify why I'm uh, uh, using this trademark. I can justify why this idea is viable and why we don't have anything to do with TNKBP and uh, petroleum whatsoever. So these things and these rules uh, are used. They are not fixed in the legislation, but I hope that they will appear in some methodological method method Logical recommendations. I've talked about the Vacheron Constantin case. What separately I'd like to talk about? Do I still have five minutes or so? Okay. Um, I'd like to separately tell about the things that were not included into this uh, draft bill. A couple of corpus delicti. Well, first, we wanted to include this in inaction uh, clause or inaction principle. Uh, we wanted uh, another term to be introduced: business activity or business action. And it will give a business an opportunity to really prove well, why are you doing this or that. Is it because I'm trying to reach some business goals and then it's business action? Or if you're not doing anything, if you're not committing any particular actions to violate uh, others? Um, Right, so I wanted to separate these two notions, but probably we would do this next time. Next thing, and what we've offered, what kind of corpus delicti we've offered, for example, unfair competition related to the activities of employees of businesses, unfair competition related to consumers uh, with uh, uh, advertising and trade. But why didn't we do it? Because uh, it really um, mixes and intermingles with uh, neighboring uh, legislation. Okay, let's take one thing. When you say that uh, you cannot force your employees to break any relations with a brand, a company, or whatever, or whether, or when you force them not to uh, stay or not, not, not to follow the their agreement with somebody else, uh, then you violate the right of the employee on labor and freedom. Uh, so we didn't yet manage to separate these two things. However, we understand that it's unfair competition. I've talked about the consumers, and it's a pity, really, that we didn't do it because my personal position, and being an expert, and I'm in this uh, non-for-profit partnership. Uh, well, uh, there the, are the several opinions being expressed, but my personal position is that the competition has to be identified through a subject of this competition. You cannot protect the competition just by itself. Uh, because competition you cannot really touch. But when you protect the competition through a consumer, right, then you can touch it. Uh, confiscation of property. Uh, that's an interesting thing. And the reason we did it, well, was one particular case when medical equipment is supplied free of charge and then uh, all the components to this equipment that have to be buy, bought by a consumer, uh, are, the costs are compensated in one year or so. But the leader of our anti-monopoly body, Igor here, was wise, wise, and he suggested us to go to non-for-profit organizations and really ask them, do they really want this norm of, constant, of confiscation? Uh, I mean, those non-for-profits who deal with oncology, some kidney diseases and whatever. So we did it. And I think here I will answer 
answer the question of one of the participants of the conference. Does the anti-monopolist service really consider the social aspect? Yes, we do, because not-for-profit organization answered it in the following way. Yes, we know about those violations, that when we buy an equipment, it's being uh, compensated and so on and so forth. But these things are mainly about uh, corruption of the customer itself, corruption that exists in a customer's organization. But if we introduce this norm, no hospitals, no non-for-profit organizations will be able to get something free of charge. And only if... And, 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 and because of that, many patients might not get the required and the needed uh, medical service. So we decided to go away from this norm because impl implementation and introduction of this norm, and I've given many, there were many citations given this fact. Let, let us come back to Dostoevsky, who said, if a children's tear is shed, it's not worth uh, the, 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 uh, of even the whole of the planet. So even if one tear of a patient is shed, then this norm is not worth it. It's not worth introducing advertising. Let's come to that. Because we have a separate law on that, and that's why we intermingle with them. Competition. Well, there are several laws that deal about it. So partially, part of those norms, they really deserve attention. And I need to say to you that after learning and investigating some of the European uh, law, all those ideas related to unfair competition and so on and so forth, the European legislation uh, supports that. And they really say that all of the things are violations of the um, antitrust law. If you can prove that uh, the main objective is to violate the rights of another competitor, uh, obtaining profits and so on and so forth, this is unfair competition competition with all those things so we need to move forward well I do respect the audience so I'll be brief uh, there is still uh, a uh, mechanism that allows uh, to uh, complain about this mechanism uh, all through the uh, um, anti-monopoly uh, agency or through court. And if you go to the court, uh, that will be uh, resulting in the compensation of loss. And there is a principle that we strongly support, and that is the compensation of loss uh, inflicted by the competitor. I'm not talking about the uh, losses to the consumer because of the different price on gas, for instance. So they uh, uh, for instance, uh, they uh, replace my uh, commodity in the store uh, with a fake, but I want my losses to be compensated. And even if uh, they pay a 15 percent fine, so now actually the entrepreneurial community is supporting uh, uh, to uh, canceling uh, the turnover penalties, but what is my sense of satisfaction uh, apart from the fact that I won in the anti monopoly service? And this is a real impediment because I, as a company, cannot get that data from uh, the violator. It's only the anti monopoly agency can do that. So I have to ask the anti monopoly agency to get that information from another company. Uh, time limit. Time limit. Okay. So there is no mechanism like that. We want it to be developed very much. Otherwise, uh, because there is no responsibility for non-providing, non-disclosure of uh, information, it's only the anti-monopoly agency that can get the financial information about uh, the sales. And if uh, that anti-monopoly uh, agency can be a third party in the court, and then we will be fully satisfied from a uh, super satisfied uh, by the consideration of uh, those cases in the court and by the anti monopoly agency. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tatiana. I believe that the unfair competition issue is a very interesting issue from and the examples that you've demonstrated also are of great importance. Esteemed colleagues, our session is coming to an end. We've been working practically up to the end within the limits of time allotted for us by the organizers. Unfortunately, we don't have any time to ask all of the speakers, but those questions may be asked in the corridors because we're in for lunch. But summarizing, I would like to say that at least my impression of this session and, it was, w w and what was happening here, I think uh, we will remember quite a lot. 
because the issue of a golden middle between the economy and the uh, anti-monopoly regulation, we will always be going forward and really create an efficient mechanism of regulating those relationships. We were not able to answer all the questions, and probably even if we had 8 or 12 or 24 hours, uh, we would have managed to do. We would ha wouldn't have managed to do that. Our whole lives will be needed for that, and our subsequent activities will also correct the direction in which we are going. Meet you in a year, and we will look at the same issues, being one year wiser. I would like to thank everyone who cares about the anti-monopoly law, who spent four hours with us, and I heartily want to thank the speakers who participated in this panel discussion and agreed to make presentations at this session. Each presentation was very individual, very instructive, interesting, and made us think. With great thanks, I want to note the work of our interpreters. We didn't have any uh, language barriers. We talked one language, and I separately thank the interpreters who helped us in that. Thank you very much. And I wish everyone successful participation in other sessions at this legal forum. This is a Jubilee forum. We are five years old, and this needs to be celebrated. And I'm quite certain that we'll have 10, 15, and 25 fora. Thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch.